Yeah, I mean, the whole the uh, series of state theatre films were interested in um, the conditions of performativity. Like three of the films were about state representational theatres that are no longer used the way they were planned. And uh, in the specific case study in Tehran that we did, uh, we did a film uh, on the Talar Vahtat, which is the, or Talar Rudaki, which is the older name. Uh, which is the opera house that was built by the Shah. And uh, of course, in the Islamic Republic uh, currently, or since 40 years, um, ballet and opera in the Western style are not um, supported. So this theater is in use. It's not completely empty the, uh, the whole year, but it's not used the way it was planned. And also what the architecture represents is, of course, a completely different idea of society. Um, and this kind of gap between a current use and an intended use of the architecture was interesting for us. And after I had done the first film in Iran, I stayed in touch. I did a couple of smaller projects. I exhibited and made presentations in Tehran. So I stayed in touch with um, people, also a growing number of friends there. And then I got the opportunity, um, the offer by Ali Reza Rabeshka for an artist residency with CAF um, in Tehran. And uh, the topic was something with urbanism. So I took this um, opportunity as a yeah as an opportunity to start a research on the peripheries of um, of Tehran. So the film Hashti Tehran um, that I did in 2017 sort of grew out of an interest that has to do with this other film series that I mentioned, State Theater, um, because. Um, State theatre already was very much interested in architecture and, as I said, the gap between the intended use of, a, of an architecture and the actual use or non-use of, of an architecture. And the series uh, State Theatre ended with a film we did in Beirut, where, um, first of all, theatre was no longer the main topic. We declared the urban space and the city centre as the, nation, the impossible national theatre of Lebanon. Um, and um, this film again ends with a comment by um, a Lebanese artist and architect Maxim Urani who says, why are we always discussing this kind of overly symbolically charged and claimed spaces in the city center and why don't we talk about the edges of the city more where the question is also at stake are we still a citizen when we leave the city and where does the city start and begin? So there is a more of a fluidity in this kind of spaces while the spaces in the city center are so much claimed and there's everything is stuck and you cannot actually change something. So that was more or less the, the starting point of my interest in looking at um, um, peripheries or uh, at this kind of spaces that are where, where the city grows, where the city is at stake, because cities grow like this, so it's always the periphery where you redefine a city, basically, uh, and leave the symbolically charged spaces um, behind for some time. In, during the research, I tried to just see as many different kind of uh, peripheral spaces in, of the city. Um, and as you know, the, the geography is, is a very crucial element for the, how the city is, how is layered, how the layout of the city functions. Because in the north you have the mountains, in the south you have the, um, you have the desert, so the city was bound to mainly grow in the eastern-western axis. And also, um, it's a very common fact or known fact that um, this kind of geography the higher you get, the cleaner the air and the richer the people is sort of also psycho and socio um, geography of the city. So knowing that, that was one of my starting points. And I think that is still reflected also in the, in the film that I chose um, four different locations that the film would focus on. And they're all in the four directions. So it's north, west, east and south. And um, 
It turned out during the research that uh, if you go to these four directions, you find really four completely different situations and uh, spatial regimes um, that would give a good structure for the film. Um, what is very obvious for me is, um, or what is sort of uh, one of the first thing that even a visitor can experience is maybe not so much the dividing line between classes, but the dividing line between spaces. Um, which then also, uh, in a second thought, uh, are connected to classes. Um, so how people are using spaces, the dividing line between inside and outside that we also do have, of course, in Europe, like we talk about public space, all this discussion about public space, private space, that it's blurred and so on and so on. But I think uh, talking about this kind of dividing line in Tehran is very specific because here, it beca uh, while I think when we talk about class or urbanization, there are a lot of similarities between Tehran and many other cities that you can find. What I find very specific about Tehran in my personal experience, is exactly this uh, relation between Andaruni and Biruni, so the inside and the outside. They are codified in a different way without me now being able to give like a lecture on how they're codified, but it's something that you understand immediately when you enter a private house or when you enter into an office or uh, when you're in a car, if you're in a public bus or if you're in a, in a, a taxi or whatever or when you go to the, to the subway, when you move on the streets. It's something that is inscribed in this, uh, the spaces. It, uh, it uh, brings about a certain behavior that you, as a foreigner, have to adapt and have to learn. And there is not this one rule that someone can tell you that you can read in a, tr in a guidebook, uh, Lonely Planet or what. But it's something that also changes during the day um, it can be a little bit different today or tomorrow and there are spaces where it's not quite clear. Am I now in a private space? Can I shake hand with a woman or not? So all these kind of uh, things, these are dividing lines. And of course, that uh, you also, uh, one of the aspects that uh, you have to um, recognize is uh, that it works also different in different classes. That when you go to a party in a middle class penthouse in the north, the rules are different between inside and outside. Also, the, the membrane between inside and outside is, is a different one. While when you're invited in Afarabat uh, for a chai into the house of uh, the owner, you know. So these are dividing lines that are quite specific to this kind of society, the Iranian society, and maybe even Tehran. For me, Tochal um, was interesting from the very beginning um, because usually this kind of um, quality of space, this kind of snow-capped mountains, uh, recreation area, are very touristic all over the world, you know. It's a place mainly used by tourists. And uh, of course, um, the way Tocha is used by the Tehran people might look exactly like touristic use. You know, it's what you can see is more or less the same thing that tourists are doing. And you also find tourists there. But the interesting thing for me about Tocha was that it is sort of an extension to the city. Because people use it to go early morning just for some hiking and at, uh, at 6 a.m. and at 10 a.m. they're at work in their office. So it's sort of an urban space that does not look at all like an urban space. And this, this is a quality that I'm interested in. So the use of space is, is, um, is urban, but the, the visuality of it is not. So it's this kind of antithesis in a way. Um, yes, of course, the um, the fact that I started the project uh, uh, in the framework of a residency of CAF um, helped a lot because um, some pra practical things were solved, like shooting permission, accommodation for myself, uh, and so on. Um, also, um, I got to know um, one of my main collaborators on the film, which is Hedia Ahmadi, who um, not only designed the publication um, of the um, of 
um, yeah, of the f f that runs with the film, but also um, she did most of the sound recording. So also my crew that was actually depending on what day I would go where would always change. Um, and was very small. I, I did camera myself all the time. So I had uh, mostly just someone with me who would do sound recording. Um, and the conversations that you listen to the film were also recorded separately. These are partly friends of mine or friends of friends of friends. So um, yeah, it was quite a... We tried to stay under the, ra the radar without doing anything forbidden or something, but uh, we tried to keep the, the crew uh, very small and to have more of an observational approach to our topic. So that's, that's how we worked. Um, first of all, all the dialogues are recorded separately, so not with the image, not at the same day even. Uh, so they're montaged later on, um, except for some of the dialogues in the fourth part in Afarabat, obviously. Um, I tried for, for various reasons, I tried uh, not to have myself in any way interfere with the, with the con uh, conversations. Because um, in general, I think uh, interviewing as a foreigner, people would generate very different material. Um, but maybe in a situation like in Iran, um, where an official interview situation um, might be awkward or also political, people might talk differently when they talk to a foreigner in an interview situation. So I wanted to avoid that kind of thing. Um, and the second thing is that, in general, I was interested not in giving information, question and answer structure, but more like a conversation that people anyway would have. Because I think when people have a real interest, when they are actually looking for a flat, things can come out in a different way than when you try to set it up. So I tried to find, for example, people um, who are actually interested in looking for flats, and uh, I recorded their encounter with a real estate agent. Um, in the case of the second part of the film. Um, but of course they, they knew that they were recorded. The real estate agent didn't know in the moment of recording, but he knew afterwards and he was fine with that. But otherwise if we had informed him, he would have not um, reacted the same way. Um, same with Nafar Abad. Um, I tried to set up a situation. They do meet there around the fire, uh, several times a week and uh, it would look exactly the same. They would do kebab, but they knew that I would coming, this would be coming this specific day and they should be there. So that was the arrangement. So, uh, but once uh, the situation started, it was not scripted at all. Not, nothing in the film is scripted. So I just recorded conversations that are as natural as possible. And I then selected and edited out of, out of them. Because I think that people in these situations reveal things uh, about their personal situation that they might not think of or might censor themselves when they just give an interview. Well, it's always like you have some ideas, some, um, some concepts that you start working with and then you adapt it um, and on the fly. It's always like this. But of course, then uh, again, while editing, you can reconceptualize um, the material that you have. And um, for me, actually, when talking about camera, two things were uh, important. The one thing is that um, um, although it's a film about housing, so it's about a film about the insides, like how do we live together inside of houses. It's also a film about landscape, so I'm interested in this kind of panorama of what we can see. Uh, and I think the locations that I chose um, obviously show that as well. So um, usually when you're inside, you just keep the camera still, you know, you just film the sofa or whatever. And when you're outside, you want to have this panorama shot and you do panning. And I uh, sort of tried to inverse this, you know, this relation between inside and outside. Whenever the camera shows a living room situation, 
not necessarily always inside because in the fourth part we have an outdoor living room situation. The camera's panning and uh, when we show landscapes it's mostly still. So on that level the camera tries to blur this relation or this clear dividing line between uh, inside and outside on a technical level. The same is sort of with the camera angles uh, that I choose, which are most of the time wide angle shots, which sort of um, uh, represent my view. And again, it's both. It's a conceptual decision that I say, I, who am I to choose for the Iranians what is interesting and what is not in, by using close-ups. But uh, it's also... Um, yeah, it represents my, my distant position and it helped me to actually do the film, you know, because I could not sometimes get into the situation, so I could stay outside. And I leave to the viewer, of course, also to decide what they want to focus on in this wide angle shot. So, in a way, I position myself, being a foreigner, making a film about Tehran, again at this kind of inside-outside this point where inside and outside meet, the outside perspective, the inside perspective. And yeah, that's why I what I tried also to reflect in the choice of camera. So um, actually I was lucky to have the world premiere of the film in uh, Tehran. So the first screening of it was uh, as part of an architecture screening series in the Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art. And of course I was very nervous. I didn't expect many people to come, but then I found the, the, the hall packed with more than 250 people, all uh, involved in urbanism and architecture. So I was um, preparing for being uh, killed by them, but actually um, there was a lot of controversial and uh, also a lot of um, positive feedback. So I was happy that a lot of people said that I show them their own city in a way that they haven't seen it before. And of course that's the best thing that someone can say. I think it's a common known fact that uh, Tehran has an incredible art scene. I mean, it's extremely vibrant, I think. I don't know how, about how it is right now, after what happened in the last months. Of course, that might have changed the situation, but um, I mean, it's quite diverse. You can find underground galleries with like experimental art and installations and uh, media art and you can find the classic uh, commercial um, uh, art galleries that would also sell their stuff in Dubai and so on. So you can find all sorts of stuff. What I was really impressed by, I have to say, is the theatre scene that is very lively, very committed, very also politically interested and they find their own ways and aesthetics uh, of um, dealing with the situation. And as we all know, um, theatre is a contact uh, art form, so um, it uh, has, has even more or different kind of challenges um, than maybe visual art. And I mean, I don't need to mention the, the fantastic films that still come out of that country. So, yeah, impress I'm impressed. I was always impressed seeing what's going on there. <laughs>